Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on the Purdue Lecture Hall series, I have the pleasure of welcoming Barsha Voval from Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology Department here at Purdue University. Barsha does work. Uh, she's uh, in grad school and she does work with uh, Rob Stalin in his lab. And you're doing some really exciting work on Marburg virus. Is that right, Barsha? That's right. That's right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Marburg uh, Ebola viruses, these are really dangerous, dangerous viruses. And uh, I just, I'm so happy to have you on the program and be able to hear a little bit about your journey into research and what got you interested in working with viruses, especially when you tell us that you started in a different field, right? It wasn't even biology. It was physics. Is that right? Right, right. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to hear about how this uh, transpired and how you changed your mind. Uh, so, you know, what I'll do is I'll let you take it away. If you want, you can share your screen and I will shrink away and let you take the spotlight. All right. Thanks, Tommy, for that introduction and thanks for inviting me. Uh, let's start uh, presenting my screen. Is it visible? Yes, it is. All right. So welcome to my TED talk. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about what I study in lab and I'm uh, really in a preliminary stage of my grad school. So there's not a lot of research that I'm going to talk about, but I can surely tell you how and why I ended up studying uh, what I study. So I am a second year PhD student in Dr. Rob Sterling's lab and I work with the Marburg virus. So starting from a very, very basic thing, uh, viruses can be classified on a, uh, based on a lots of different stuff, but one of the very major basis of classification is the kind of genome they have inside them. So viruses can have DNA inside them. These viruses can either have a lipid envelope or not have them. And based on a bunch of other stuff, they can be again subdivided into all these families. Now my lab is interested in RNA viruses like the viruses that have RNA inside them as their genome. And this RNA can again be single-stranded or double-stranded. The single-stranded RNA can be positive or negative, which means, means whether when the virus comes into the host cell, whether it can directly start producing protein, which is a positive strand virus, or it cannot directly start producing proteins and it has to go through a number of intermediate steps in order to uh, start producing proteins and hijack the host cells, which are called the negative strand viruses. And my lab is interested in, in these viruses, which are the Ebola and Marburg virus. These are negative stranded, single stranded RNA viruses. And more recently, my lab started working on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is a positive stranded, single stranded RNA virus. Now, the Marburg virus disease was first uh, identified or the first outbreak happened in 1967 in Marburg in Germany. The, the virus was introduced by the, these African green monkeys that were brought there for some kind of polio research. And somehow the virus spilled over from the uh, monkeys to humans and further research found out that the reservoir species for these virus are Egyptian fruit bats. So uh, before I go into the structure of the virus, uh, I'd like to say what happens when you get this virus. So this virus uh, can give you like uh, not very severe symptoms like 
uh, fevers or chills or headaches, but when it progresses to a much more severe stage, it can give you hemorrhagic fever, which can cause internal bleeding in your organs and liver damage, which, which can ultimately be fatal. Now, there, there are no approved drugs or vaccines uh, that are available for these disease. Uh, supportive care is the only option, and a number of repurposed drugs are, are currently under research for um, clinical trials to see if they're effective against the disease, and some, some vaccines are also in research, but as of now, we don't have anything. So if you get this virus and you're not treated well, you die and it has a very high fatality rate once it progresses into the uh, more severe hemorrhagic fever stage. The most, uh, so this, the most, or the multiple number of outbreaks have been seen in different parts of Africa. Uh, the last outbreak uh, happened earlier this year in, in February in Guinea. So how does this virus look like? So this virus belongs to the phylovirus family, which means the virus is filamentous in shape. So as you can see, the virus is elongated and it has these multiple different proteins uh, that are coded by this genome that it brings in. So, the, uh, so I would like to talk about not all of these proteins, but some. So here we have the GP or the glycoprotein, which stands out as spikes on this uh, double layer that you see. So this double layer is a lipid bilayer that is derived from the host cell when the virus uh, infects the host, host cell and gets out of the host cell. It steals this lipid envelope from the host cells. This glycoprotein right here is important for entry of the virus into the host cell. Uh, we also have a number of different proteins inside the virus that help in uh, replication of the viral genome or stabilizing the genome by directly binding to it. And the protein that our lab uh, is most interested in is this protein called VP40, uh, which is called so because this protein has a molecular weight of 40 kilodaltons. This protein is a matrix protein. As you can see, it lines the lipid membrane from the inside and it holds up the shape of the virus. So this is the VP40 protein and it is very important for exit of the virus from the host cell. In fact, it is uh, sufficient for the virus to have just this protein to get out of the cell. We'll touch on this more as we go into our next slides. This is a very cool picture when we uh, look at this, vi when we can look at this virus under the microscope, this this is a transmission electron microscopy image of the Marburg virus variant. And you can see it is long filamentous in shape. You can see some of these glycoproteins sticking out of the um, variant and this VP40 lining the envelope. Now, this virus like particles are the model system that we use in our labs. So this virus is a very deadly virus and working with this can be a little dangerous. So what can we do to make sure that uh, some kind of accidents don't happen in the lab or the kind of facilities that we have in the lab, uh, they are not well equipped to handle the complete virulent virus. So instead we use these uh, things called virus like particles, which are a kind of attenuated form of the virus, and you'll see how. So what we do is we take a plasmid expressing this VP40 protein, and we uh, insert that into the host cell. It's called transfection. We insert that into the host cell. The plasmid gets inside the host cell, and it starts producing the VP40 protein with help of the host cell machinery. So these, these are, uh, this is just a schematic representation of the VP40 protein. So it, it's produced inside the cell and it forms dimers. So two of two each of the VP40 molecules come together to form the dimers. These dimers then go and oligomerize at the host cell membrane. So they start lining up at the host cell membrane, just like you saw in the actual Marburg virus. They, these matrix protein was lining up against the lipid envelope. 
these uh, this oligomerization then induces a curvature of the membrane and this membrane starts bending like this and it will finally bud off from here and what we get is a vlp so this this is the lipid bilayer that is derived from the host that was bud that did bud off from the host and uh, we have the vp40 protein that's lining the lipid envelope so this thing right here is called a virus-like particle or a VLP. So the VLP contains only the VP40 protein. So the VP40 protein is enough for the virus to have to get out of the cell. This does not contain the viral genome and does not contain any other viral proteins, which means it cannot replicate. It cannot, uh, since there is no viral genome, there's nothing that can be replicated. And since there is no glycoprotein present here, it cannot enter new cells. Therefore, this uh, system is not, in, not uh, replication competent and not infectious. Therefore, we have two layers of security uh, while using these um, particles and we can easily study the importance or different functions of this protein using this system. It's a great model system that we use. In fact, all the different viruses that we use in our lab, this is a very go-to system that we use for studying them. So my research starts from a paper that was published in 2017, where uh, a group of scientists try to adapt Marburg virus in skid mice. These are immuno immunodeficient mice. So when you inject them with a the virus, they cannot uh, mount an adaptive immune response and they will get the disease. So these group of scientists uh, tried passaging the Marburg virus uh, in mice. So what they did is they infected a group of mice with the virus, that's passage one. Then when the mice got, mice got sick, they collected the virus from the mice and uh, used that virus to infect another batch of cells that, uh, sorry, another, but another, bunch of mice so that's passage two in this way they did a number of passages uh, in mice to see how the marburg virus adapted in small animals so this uh, so at each and every step they collected the virus from the mice and did a deep sequencing to see the uh, amino acid sequence of the virus that was present in the mice, they found that they, the, the virus was not acquiring any new mutations after 24 passages, but it was still lethal to the mice. So whatever mutations they got by those 24 passages was still uh, important for maintaining lethality in the mice, but they definitely have some other functions for which they were selected for in this mice. So a lot of changes were found in the first 100 amino acids of the VP40 protein. Uh, and we study some, some of these mutations to see how uh, these mutations affect different functions of the, vi uh, of the protein. So this, the VP40 protein looks something like this. It, this is the dimer. This here is a single monomer. This is another monomer. And this is just a schematic representation of how, how a monomer looks. Right here at the end terminal, we have the dimer interface. And here at the C terminal, we have this patch, which can bind to the membrane, which is important for the oligomerization to the membrane. And uh, the mutations that we study are these five mutations and we compared them to the wild type, which does not have the mutations. So uh, I'd like to point out where uh, these different mutations are. So this is the G79S mutation. Uh, this is not at the dimer interface or at the membrane binding patch. So we expect this uh, to not affect the membrane binding capacity or the dimerization um, capacity anyway, but that's what we expect, but we, we still have to do the experiments to see what they actually do. Right here is the L96P mutation, which is, as you can see, it's just on the top of the dimer interface. And 
changing the uh, uh, the uh, L amino acid to a proline amino acid actually is so a pro introducing a proline causes kinks and bends in the uh, amino acid chain. So if there's a kink or bend formed here, it it's possible that it might affect the dimerization somehow. And if the dimerization is important for the membrane binding uh, function of the virus, we can expect or we might see a change in the membrane localization as well. Uh, right here is the uh, E260A mutations. So this one, this one here, it's close to the membrane binding patch and we might expect that change. So these membrane binding patch, the this, associates with anionic lipids in the cell membrane. And E is an anionic, uh, so uh, it's a negatively charged amino acid and A is a neutral amino acid. So changing an anionic amino or a negatively charged amino acid to a neutral amino acid might enhance the membrane binding a little bit because the membrane itself is anionic and it might reduce the electrostatic repulsion right there, and that applies to all of these three mutations. Uh, the, the 238 mutation is pretty far away from the membrane binding patch, so we don't expect a lot of effect on the membrane binding. And the E268A is again pretty close to the membrane binding patch, so we expect to see a slight change in the membrane binding. So how do we do this plasma membrane localization studies? So what we do is we take a plasmid that uh, has a GFP protein uh, fused with it. So when the, <clears throat> when the plasmid goes inside the cell and it produces the protein, it will have the VP40 protein along with the GFP tag. The GFP is a green fluorescent protein, which means it can emit green light when a correct when a laser of correct wavelength is shined on it. Uh, so what we do is we shine the laser on these cells, and we use different stains. So use a stain uh, which stains the nucleus. We use another stain that stains the plasma membrane. And as we shine light on these uh, cells, we can see the plasma membrane uh, turning bright red the nucleus turning bright blue and the VP40 protein turning bright green because of this GFP protein. Uh, so we can see either the GFP protein localized pretty close to the membrane or if it's, a, or the mutations are affecting the membrane localization of VP40, we expect to see the VP40 or the green signal that's diffused over the cytoplasm. This instrument is a very cool instrument. I love working with it. It's called a confocal microscope. This is what we use for looking at those cells. It has a laser and it uses two lenses to focus uh, the beam uh, that passes through the sample. So it's called confocal because it uses like two concentric lenses. So that's where the confocal comes from. And this is what the data looks like when we look at it under the confocal microscope. I love looking at these pictures. These are like so bright and when we get good data, it just makes my day. Uh, so right here we see the host is the red stain that stains the plasma membrane. So right here we see that the plasma membrane uh, or these stains the boundaries of the plasma membrane. So we know where these cells are. We have WGA or wheat germ agglutinin that stains the nucleus and the nucleus turns blue. And we have uh, GFP or uh, the green fluorescent protein that's tagged to our protein of interest. So we can see where our uh, protein of interest is inside the cell. And we can just merge these three images just to look at a comprehensive image. So the wild type is our standard and we see that this green protein is located pretty close to the plasma membrane. It just lines wherever the plasma membrane is. Uh, 
The G79S, the first mutation that I talked about, uh, I expected it to not show much deviation from the wild type, and we can see it's pretty much localized close to the membrane. The L96P, if you can remember, was right on top of the dimer interface, and it might have affected somehow the dimerization of the uh, VP40, and that in turn might have an effect on the plasma membrane oligomerization. And here you see the green is diffused all over the cytoplasm, and it's not as localized to the membrane as a wild type or this one. Uh, the E238A was a little bit away from the membrane binding patch, so I did not expect a lot of difference to happen uh, uh, as compared to the wild type, and that's what we see here. But in these two uh, proteins, uh, I expected the plasma membrane localization to increase by a little bit, which it did. Probably this is not very apparent from these images, but when I quantified them, they showed a little bit of increase, which again wasn't very significant when I did these statistical tests on them, which wasn't very significant. So as of now, I don't have more data on this, so I cannot conclude what these means but I have a number of more experiments coming up that can shed more light on what's happening here. So this is just this data. We use a software called ImageJ to quantify this data, to actually calculate how much of the green signal is uh, overlapping with the red signal. And we can plot that data, something like this. So we see the L96P goes down a little bit than the wild type. However, this did not come out to be significant. And these two mutants that I expected to uh, increase the plasma membrane localization a little bit, it did a little bit compared to the wild type. But again, it was not significant compared to the wild type. However, the L96P that reduced the membrane localization, it was significant compared to that. Again, I cannot comment right now on what this actually means in terms of the uh, mechanism of VP40 oligomerization or budding, but I have a number of more experiments coming up that can tell me more about this. So the next steps that I have is we want to observe if the mutations affect VLP production. For that, what we will two is we will take our plasmid containing VP40 or the plasmid that encodes for VP40 and we will put them into it into our cell culture uh, cells and we have a protocol for uh, purifying the VLPs and uh, the cell lysate. So cell lysate is the amount of protein that would stay inside the cell and not come out and VLP will be the the variant particles that came out of the cell when we have our protocol for purifying these and finally, we can run them on a Western blot. So a Western blot is a method where we can uh, take a mixture of proteins and they can be separated on the basis of their weight. So, in, so the, we will get a band uh, or a column where the top bands will be the higher molecular weight proteins and the uh, lower bands will be the lower molecular weight proteins. And if we know them where our proteins should turn up uh, or the molecular weight of the protein, we can predict where on the uh, column we will see our protein. And this is a very common method of detecting proteins from uh, cell lysates. So we can see if the amount of VLP produced is higher or lower compared to the wild type in any of these mutants. And the next thing that we can do is observe if the mutations affect dimerization. So for that, we will use a bacteria. So this is a mammalian cell culture. And the, for this experiment, we will use a bacterial cell culture. And we will use, the again, the plasmid containing VP40. Obviously, this is a different plasmid, which will be optimized for bacterial cell expression. And uh, this will be used to transform the bacterial cells. They will be grown in a culture. Again, we have a protocol for purifying these proteins. And we, um, as we purify them, we get something like this, which shows, so we get a, a certain volume, say 50 mils of protein mixture, and we can uh, purify them and get them in different fractions. And there's this instrument, um, the protein purification instrument that shows us at what fraction we get um, our desired 
peak of uh, protein. So we use a uh, a spectrometer to find out where our uh, desired protein peak is, and using this we can get information with so if if our protein is a dimer it will form a peak at a different location if it's a, a monomer it will form a peak at, a, at another different location so from this graph that we find we can find more information if the mutants are affecting dimerization or if the amount of protein produced is changing so that was all about my research that i have done and i will be uh, doing in this lab but my story starts five years earlier when I just I was I just passed high school and I joined uh, this university called Jadavpur University in the Department of Physics back in India where I used to live. I joined the Bachelor of Science program in Physics and this is a picture of my campus. It's a it's a pretty small campus compared to Purdue, but it's very beautiful. I love going there. Even on the days I didn't have classes, I would just go to the campus and just sit there and work and do stuff. But when I when I chose my major, I was in a little bit of dilemma whether I should go with physics or I should go something related to biology because I liked both of these subjects, but it was a hard decision for me. I chose physics. I did not like it. it so in school, I felt like this. When I was in college, I kind of felt like this. In school, we, we were like sad when we got something like 80%. In college, we were like very happy if we could score after 70%. It was hard. And in India, the, uh, the education system is a little different from what it's like here. We don't get to choose what courses we take. There's a set pattern of courses that everyone enrolled in a program has to take. And there's very little, or I would say there's no choice on what courses we can take. That has changed a little bit now. As I talk to my juniors now, they say they have a little bit of more choice. But when I was there, there wasn't any and the courses that we had to take i wasn't finding my go to thing or this was this one subject that's that fascinates me the most or there's this one topic that i'm very interested in or this one thing that i'm very eager to learn about i could not find that thing it was hard for me but then i was the recipient of a scholarship which needed me to work uh, in labs in summers in the in my uh, undergrad and that's when i was introduced to the research culture because again in india undergrad research is not as common as in the us so when i was in my second year of my bachelor's i started working with dr shukhendash in a material science and nanobiophysics research group uh, I worked with uh, a PhD student called Shubham Roy. He has already graduated from that, that lab, and I think he's pursuing his postdoc in China. I worked with him in uh, synthesizing FeOOH nanoparticles and uh, analyzing it, characterizing it, and looking at how uh, what potential it has in terms of uh, being used in a solar cell. So we found out that that the dielectric properties or, uh, of this particular nanoparticle increases with uh, reduction in grain size. What that means is a dielectric uh, is something that can hold electricity or it can hold current. So when we, we can charge a dielectric and higher the dielectric properties, the more charge it can hold. So we saw that the uh, dielectric properties of this particle went up as its size was reduced to a nanoscale. So that showed a lot of potential of this particle to be incorporated in thin films and be used in solar cells so that as the particle size went down, it could hold more and more charge and it, it could be a very good battery. We completed a part of this project in there. Uh, it was like my first research experience. I wouldn't say I did a lot of work, but it was just my introduction to research culture or how a lab runs or like very basic instruments or looking at how like shadowing the other grad students in the lab to see how these research or how these instruments function. 
it was, I, I would say it was a very good learning experience from me and uh, Dr. Das was very supportive and uh, I really liked working with them. The third year of my uh, undergrad, I joined, I went to a different institute for, so the previous work that I did was in my uh, university. This was a different institute. Institute called Indian Institute of Chemical Biology. I was working the summer over there with an internship. Uh, and this is where I got my first biophysics or bioinformatics or structural biology research experience. So as I uh, worked through my um, courses, since I wasn't finding my thing, I still had the idea of biology back in my head. So I wanted to explore if I could, if there's the way I could change my um, educational track. I could, if I could, if there's a way I could change my major while uh, not completely starting from scratch, but uh, you know, if there's there's something interdisciplinary that I could still do while being in physics. So I started looking into those options and this is one great opportunity that I found. In this lab, I worked with purification and crystallization of a bacterial pathway protein. So histidine biosynthesis uh, is an important pathway in Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's a, a pathogen that can affect humans. It can, it can affect humans from so it's it, it can be a hospital acquired infection and it can form biofilms in the lung, which is not a very good thing and it's very hard to get rid of. And this protein in the uh, in this bacteria is a it's very important for the survival of this bacteria. And it this protein is not present or it's not important for humans. So this lab targeted this specific protein and tried to figure out the structure of these proteins in order to um, think about designing anti uh, or antibacterial drugs or somehow inhibiting this protein so that it could not do its job and the bacteria would die. So I learned how a biology lab runs from very basic stuff, like from growing cell cultures to uh, purifying proteins or running the autoclave or how, how the autoclave machine works. Even I learned pipetting in this lab. So we grew the protein in a bacterial culture with this protein had a his tag. So these tags, proteins having different tags are used in purifying a protein. And then we use the purified proteins to, to set up different protein crystals and the crystals were beautiful. I did not uh, stay long enough in this lab because it was a summer internship. I could not stay long enough to wait till the structure was uh, studied in more detail. The, the major thing that I uh, was focusing on was the purification of the protein. I just, I found this very cool when I first learned it and I just want to show you how this thing works. So we have, uh, we have these columns which are used to purify proteins and we have some resins or some beads that uh, contain a complementary tag as uh, the one present on the protein. So when we pass our protein through it or the protein mixture through it, our protein of interest that contains the tag will bind to the complementary tag in the resins and everything else will get washed out. We can then use um, uh, something that would uh, loosen the bond between this tag and the complementary tag and we can collect the purified protein in this way. I found this thing very cool and this is uh, so when I started applying for uh, grad school or for PhD positions, uh, this was one thing that I really wanted to do. I graduated uh, my bachelor's degree in 2019. This is my mother. She has been a very, she has been very supportive throughout my journey whenever like when I was feeling lost, I could, I didn't know what I was about to do. I had thought of quitting. Uh, uh, pretty much a lot of times, but she she was always there for me. And then I started a master's degree when COVID hit. And in in so this was again in the physics department, but I knew they had a biophysics course. 
so that's when i like i got to know like i could still stay in physics and i could uh, maybe shift a bit to biophysics and see what this is all about i finally got to do that biophysics course which was very cool like again it was a uh, covid time so we could not get all the lab experience that we needed or we wanted to get but at least getting to study the subject was a good starting point for me is what i think i had a great opportunity for a summer internship which again got cancelled because of covid i myself got covid and then uh, on the brighter side of th things i could stay home for a long time i spent some great time with my family and especially it was like the last few years before i moved abroad for my phd so i really enjoyed that time with them uh, i start i used so i didn't have to go to class everything was online so i had a lot more time that i could use for applying to uh, degrees or uh, degree programs abroad i used that time well i started applying for a uh, phd courses and i got a few offers from the top from my top choices of grad school so yay and now i'm here in dr robert stellen's lab this is my these are my lab mates uh i don't think all of them are here but yes a lot of them are here we are a very fun lab we celebrate a lot of things uh we this was our lab christmas party last last uh, december uh we do we work uh, so when i when i was rotating in this lab i i got the opportunity to be mentored by some great uh uh grad students on this lab uh, i don't so yeah this is rupashi who actually trained me in the ways of this lab when i was Uh, a rotating student in this lab i really like this lab and i was like pretty sure this is the one i want to join when um while i was rotating uh so one thing i'd like to point out is that you see a lot of women in our lab but it's not the case everywhere uh, around the world so statistics says there there's a very low representation of women in stem and when i was back in my country doing my undergrad or my masters there were like six women in a group in a cohort of 50 or 60 people so that's like a very apparent disparity and i would like to take this opportunity to everyone listening out there to all the young women please do science it's really cool you'll love it if you if you love it please consider taking it forward is life as a phd student smooth not at all so we have to do a lot of reading as grad students a lot of reading and writing and often procrastination hits and we have a, a bunch of unread papers uh, sitting in those folders that we have to read and only when the deadlines come up that when we, that's when we start reading them or we start doing them but here's a little life hack phd will not be very hard or it will not be very stressing if you just remember to have some chocolate from time to time so scientists and cookies both work better when you have chocolates and before i end i would like to say uh, all through these years besides studying i am a dancer i did not let go of my passion i still participated in a lot of programs and uh, i practiced regularly and in my days of college when i felt lost it was one thing that kept me going so if you have a hobby or something that you really love doing apart from studying uh that you don't want to make a career out, out of but you still want to do it because you love it please don't leave it because because you think you don't have enough time from your studies so Thanks for coming to my TED talk. That would be all. Do you have any questions? Awesome, awesome. That was awesome, Barsha. And thank you so much for those uh, tidbits of guidance. And uh, yeah, I guess we can stop sharing the screen. There we go. Um, that that's really really neat. I you know I'm I, I I'm curious to learn. 
was your mom an influence in getting you curious about science? I uh, I know you you brought her up in in your in your TED talk. I love how you said that. That's great. Uh, was was she an influence in you being interested in science? Yes, my mom, she also holds a PhD. She's a chemistry teacher at a school back in India. Uh -huh. And I never had chemistry, like I never had problems with chemistry because she used, well, I did not like studying chemistry to be clear, but the way she guided me, I did not have problem in passing my courses ever. So yeah, that she was a very like, I kind of never thought about other uh, care, even if I did it, wasn't very like it was kind of said in my head that that's what my mom did that's what I'm gonna do that's awesome and but it seems now that you are doing a little bit more I wouldn't say classical chemistry by any means but you definitely have to deal with chemistry mm -hmm. in the work that you do and Maybe you can tell us a little bit about, okay, you don't like it, but you still have to do some of it. Mm -hmm. And exactly. is that, so do you get to do things that you like and things that you don't like too? Is that, is that how it goes? So I don't have to do a lot of chemistry, I would say. I'm more on the uh, cell biology side. I love what I'm doing, but the little bit of chemistry that comes with it, I think I can handle it. So yeah. it's a little fun fact is when I call up my mom every day, when I talk to her, I, I tell her that when I chose my major, I was like, anything I do, I'd not do chemistry, but right now my degree has a chemistry in it. That's right, that's right. It's medicinal <laughs> chemistry. So tell us, you know, you mentioned Dr. Stalin. Tell us a little bit how it works in terms of like, are you working with other students in teams or does everybody have their own project? Tell us a little bit so that people understand the dynamics in the lab. So there are a multiple number of projects that are going on in the lab. Currently, uh, I am on a team that works with filoviruses in general, but I'm the only one that works with Marburg viruses. The other people in that team, they work with Ebola viruses, but different aspects of the Ebola viruses. So again, their projects are pretty different from each other, but again, the filoviruses thing brings us together. And another thing I might mention here is when I joined this lab, I actually started working on SARS-CoV-2 and things weren't really working out. I wasn't getting good results and months and months of troubleshooting wasn't really giving me any results. So uh, we just decided to switch projects. So my bit of advice over there is physics did not work out for me, but I was able to like stick to it and change or shift my career path a little bit and now it works out same to my same as my project uh, the first project wasn't working very well but you know I found a way out so don't lose hope you'll do good yeah that's I think that's really true I mean it's it's not that things don't go well meaning that like oh you don't you don't really uh you don't you, it's not like you're breaking stuff in the lab but mm -hmm. that that experiments are really not panning out uh how you anticipate them and they need to be adjusted and they need to be redone right. and right. redone until right. right and and i think right. that in that respect it takes a certain uh, level of will and interest and ambition mm -hmm. to to keep going what keeps you going what uh, what keeps you motivated when you see that oh okay this experiment didn't work out but I still have eight other experiments that I'm doing that those might work out what keeps you motivated hmm, that's a great question um I guess I've got a very supportive lab that I can uh, Rob is a very, so I should have just said it in the, pro, in the presentation, but yeah, Rob is kind of the best uh, boss you can get. I can go into his office and I can cry my eyes out like my experiments are not running. I'm not being able to do this thing. And he, he will be like very supportive with everything. So that's a very, that's a very important thing also that I would like to say to people, like when you 
choose your lab, see how their lab environment is, see how supportive they are, how supportive your peers are. I could go up to the other grad students saying, hey, this experiment is not working. Can you come look at it? Or the other people who are working on different things, they are like, can I can I look at you doing or setting up this thing so just I can make sure you're doing everything right? And I'm like, yeah, sure, come on. Yeah. So that's uh, a, a supportive lab is, I guess, the biggest blessing that I have here. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. And what about what about in India when you first got started with doing lab research? Um, how was that experience? How was the how did you get started? Did you contact the profs or was there a program where you could just go and, and rotate, as we said? So the scholarship program that I was in, they required me to do summer research, but they did not have fixed guidelines on where to go. So I could do it anywhere I wanted. So I started off in my own department. I looked at uh, the profiles and this person that I worked with, Dr. Shukendash, he works in biophysics and uh, nanoparticle uh, research. So I went up to him and I said, uh, I need to do this research and I just wanted to get some experience in working in a lab. So yeah, I, uh, I joined like that. Uh, so the first, like the first experience, it was, I'd say it was overwhelming because I have never been in a proper research lab before that, the culture and the lab culture and how things work. It was pretty different from just being in class. Yeah, but it was, it was a learning experience. Like I did not get too much research research done, but it was. Yeah. getting to know how a lab functions totally totally and and you know one of the things Parsha, that i i wanted to uh, the reason why i really wanted you to be on on the purdue lecture hall series is because you have um you have just essentially started to get going in your PhD. And there was something you said in your presentation that struck with me and, and that you said, oh, now I found, I really found what I wanted to, what I wanted to be doing. How did you know? And, you know, the, again, being so close at the beginning, uh, it's wonderful to see this enlightenment, uh, for for going down this path and and doing the work that you're doing, which we understand is difficult and you don't always get the results that you want and you need to stay motivated. But you know what what was it like when you finally said, Oh, I like this. This is what I want to do. Um That's really hard to say because there, I don't think there was a moment of enlightenment when I knew that this is what I wanted to do. It, it was more like a growth curve that I keep doing the same things every day, but I still want to go to lab the next day. It's not like, yeah. I just want to, I mean, I do get my days when uh, I just want to quit everything and just go back home. But as long as that's not every day it, it'll be fine yeah. <laughs> that's great i love the way that you put it as long as it's not every day uh but that's great and i i am so amazed by the work you're doing now it's so interesting all of the 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 fluorescent microscopy that you're doing as well is the, is it a lot of time on the microscope i know a lot of people that watch the program they want to mm -hmm. know what is it that you actually do what is it what experiments are you actually uh doing in the lab and what instruments do you get to work with so are you doing some of this microscopy yourself Yes, so all that data I showed were all those pictures are taken by me. So on an average, uh, so we need to emit single cells. So as uh, if you remember, there were like single green cells on the uh, pictures that I showed. I had to like skim through the plate and look at uh, all the cells that I have to find a single green cell, not two green cells that are clubbed together. And right. for finding like, 10 to 12 green cells, it takes an, on an average like one and a half hours. Mm -hmm. So 
at uh, one time I work with six mutants. So at uh, one time I take two of those mutants, I spend three hours at the microscope. So it takes me uh, three days in total to finish six mutants. That's the imaging part. And before that, I the transfection thing, that's just a half an hour to 45 minutes thing. Yeah. I just make the uh, DNA, solution, uh, DNA solution and just put them in the cell and just let them grow for yeah. some time. So that there's that the microscopy experiment and the VLP collection experiment. I've just started on that. I uh, uh, still troubleshooting. So that takes a few days uh, of different steps, like doing a, doing a half an hour or one hour thing and letting it sit for a day or over the night. And then again, coming in the next day and the purification or collection steps that takes like the whole work day. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So neat, so neat. And and I like I like the I like the the approach that you have in terms of uh, you take it. You're taking it like with stride, and you know it, it. It I think that the reality is that many times we go into university and we don't necessarily know. Uh, what's the route to take, what what not to take. But it sounds like you've um, at least had an opportunity to try different things and, uh, right. you know, experiment with different things. And so maybe that's the lesson learned here from your story is that don't be afraid to try, be, you know, be open to, to new experiences, be open to new, uh, new fields, even of, of study. But I think from, from what I could tell, you're bringing a little bit of your physics into, into your work too, which is great. Uh, and that's exactly what it's all about is you never mm -hmm. lose, you never lose what you did before. You just keep adding totally. new stuff, right? Totally. And I'm very thankful that I got to try out different things because the first research experience I had, it was in biology, but from that I knew I could survive in a lab, but probably this is not the kind of lab that I want to be in. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Well, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Barsha Boval from Medicinal Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology in the Stalin Lab uh, at MCMP here at Purdue University. Thank you so much for telling us your story and telling us about your wonderful research and the work that you're doing is, is really exciting. And uh, I, I really I thank you for, for being so open and telling us about your, your entire trajectory. So uh, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. You have a good day too. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.